My talk today then um, is a little bit of a combination of uh, hubris and perhaps foolishness because I'll be talking about a lot of the things that Jim Haver discovered and pioneered using tools that Bernard uh, also dis discovered and pioneered. And so what, and I started my career in budding yeast, which I really love because it's got all these great things that make it useful with its high levels of homologous recombination, which allow us to change the genome at will. And there's a lot, always been a large community of researchers that can make multiple tools available. And the cellular processes that we studied have always been well conserved in mammals, but there's been a few that have been absent that we wanted to look at more. And so for that reason, we've moved to the fission yeast schizosaccharomyces, POMBI. Now, POMBI is useful because it's extremely different from yeast. And so I'm using this dendrogram from a recent Dujon paper showing lots of budding yeast and where Pombi sits, which is near the root of this tree, uh, close to the time a billion years ago when the progenitors for other eukaryotes uh, descended off. And so what that means then is that we have a very different biology in Schizosaccharomyces Pombi. Some of its processes are actually a little more similar to metazoans. Uh, so of course splicing, which Joanne Wise works on here, it has RNAi, some of the chromatin modifications, and then uh, importantly, some of the DNA repair proteins. And of course, the chromosomes condense a little more, but we don't work on that. Uh, and there are some different differences in chromosomal organization that I think uh, may be contributing to the stories I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, but the useful part is we can use similar methodologies as Cerevisiae, and of course, we have a sequenced annotated genome. Now, Pombe's genome is about the same size as Cerevisiae, but it's packaged into three chromosomes instead of 16. And so that means it's sent. One of the associations with that, if not consequences, is uh, that the centromeres are, much, are more complex and much larger. And the DNA that's right next to the telomere repeats is also larger and more complex. Uh, and that plays a role in some of the stories I'll be telling you. Um, and now in Cerevisiae, while we know we have high levels of recombination, Pombi has pretty high levels of recombination. So it's possible to do most of the things in Cerevisiae that in Pombi, uh, but it's not quite as high in Cerevisiae. And while there's a lot of molecular tools available from the Cerevisiae community, the Pombi community uh, is smaller and there hasn't been as much development. And in the course of developing some of these things for work we wanted to do, uh, we, we made the discoveries I'll tell you about today. So as Jim was telling you earlier before my pointer is going, um, so I can use either, Alan will get me one or I'll use the mouse. But the, uh, so, locate, the first thing that Jim was telling you about in a lecture about location, 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 where <coughs> Pombi has, seems to have a backup mechanism to heal double strand breaks in the, in the telomere. And so this was done by two case graduate students, Jessica Eisenstadt and Jin Yu Wang in my lab. And thanks, Phil. <coughs> and then the other story I'm going to tell you about is the, oh, green, uh, <coughs> is prepping a, a DNA break with non, with non ligatable ends for repair. And this was done by a, graduate, a former graduate student in the lab, Yan Wei Li, um, which uh, has focused on the MRN complex, which seems to have different roles in Pombi versus uh, Cerevisiae. So, what, how do cells generally respond to a double strand break? So, if we look at this diagram of a chromosome with telomeres and centromeres, Damage in there can, re can result in processing to a double strand break. The break itself can induce arrest through checkpoint activation. Or mitosis then can segregate fragments into different cells and you can get uh, arrest or death. So the, one of the key tools, which Jim has already told you about then, is, it, is an inducible double strand break, which in Cerevisiae has already existed for about three decades. But in Pombi, didn't really, we didn't really have a good rapidly inducible double strand break until 2013. So we've, of the three systems, two of them have been made by, uh, in our lab or with, uh, in collaboration. And that's based on taking this tetracycline repressor from bacteria, putting it behind a strong Palm B promoter. And that repressor is then used to repress a hybrid promoter, which is driving Bernard uh, Dujon's ISCE1 uh, endonuclease. Uh, now there's no ISCE1 sites in the S Palm B genome, so you, uh, to study double strand breaks, then we can put a marker gene with an ISCE1 site at some other genomic location. And the addition of inducer then allows the production of ISCE1 and we get breakage of the marker. 
and the two things that we have been using as our uh, Centromeric uh, located marker, where when we induce ISCE1, within about 40 minutes, 75% of these are broken in a PCR assay. And then we're also working at a sub, looking at a subtelomeric ISCE1 site. So here is the, the rapidly cut Centromeric marker. And then we have a similar marker that we put in some of the last unique sequences on the end of, right end of chromosome 2. And I want to talk a little bit about these subtelomeric sequences in S. Pombi, where they all contain, next to these telomere repeats that are added by telomerase, a large stretch of nine unique sequence that's repeated at four out of the other six, uh, out of the six chromosome ends, where the other two also are capped by these large, by large repeated sequences, but in that case, it's the genes that encode ribosomal RNA. So we have these two sequences, two sets of uh, different breaks, and I've already shown, told you that the ISCE1 uh, site at the centromere is broken quickly. And so we also looked at the, or Jessica and Jinyu looked at the breakage at the, at the subtelomeric locus. So here is the original uncut fragment and then after you add inducer, you get a rapid uh, reduction of that. We can see some of the broken fragment, but it's rapidly degraded and it's almost impossible. It's very difficult to see the, the fragment on this side. So we're certainly getting breakage and degradation at the subtelomeric locus. And so the next thing I'm going to tell you about is how the cells actually respond to this break. So <clears throat> this is, again, the damage processing, which leads to arrest. And then if you look at the ISCE1 site uh, that's at near the centromere, if we plate the cells onto media that continuously induce the nuclease and we get the break, what we see is a rest. And that's shown in this sort of uh, spot test experiment where we take exponentially growing cells of limiting, limiting amounts, spot them onto media that continuously induces ISCE1. And if you have the site but don't express the enzyme or you express the enzyme but you don't have the site, cells grow just fine. But if you have both the site and the enzyme, uh, you see a severe growth arrest. So <clears throat> that, that's all going as what we expect. When we do the same experiment at the subtelomere and we get the cleavage and degradation I showed you on the previous slide, we get something very different which, and unexpected, which was this region-specific healing of the break. And you can see here that whether you, if you don't have the enzyme or you do have the enzyme uh, and the subtelomeric site, we still get substantial amounts of growth. So that shows you that we get there, you know, something very different uh, and interesting is happening. Uh, so when we look, we, this is a, something we wanted to look at. And looking at the S. Pombi uh, sequence genome, we think it's the organization that, uh, that's in these larger chromosomes that's actually allowing us to get this healing. So this is a rather busy slide, but I want, what, I, what I'm meaning to show you here is these are the two chromosomes that have the chromosome ends with these repeated sequences that are at each end. And inside these, as well as out in these unique regions of the DNA, are a family of pombi specific genes, which are called Duff 999. And these families have unknown function. They encode some small hydrophobic, uh, possibly membrane protein. Uh, and we had, when we chose our site, uh, it was actually in between these two genes, where here's the ISCE1 site. So Jessica and Jinyu looked at some of the survivors that we got out of inducing this break, and then used PCR to look for the presence or absence of those sequences. And what they found is that this region here was deleted after ISCE1 cutting. And the sequences that were present was this protein here, DEF protein uh, 7 gene. And so because it was a member of this family, and we've been reading all sorts of homologous re and non-homologous and joining papers for years, that's led to, immediately led to this hypothesis in which cutting at the site would lead to breakage and degradation. And that would free up then the DUF protein 7 gene for recombination with other DUF family members. Now, sequence analysis of the fusion product um, suggested that it was the DUF, it was the protein 8 gene, which is on chrome, the right end of chromosome 2, or the 6 gene number 6, which is on the right, left end of chromosome 2. And we couldn't really distinguish those because all the rest of the known sequence from the genome between these is like 99% identical 
uh, and rather far away. So the end product of this is then, even though you have a double strand break, you can delete this interior region, which only contains about seven non-essential genes, and reacquire the telomere, and that's why we get 80% of the cells after the double strand break surviving because of this natural organization. So as a, to get some positive data for, for this, I just want to show you uh, an experiment that they did because the DUF6 and the and eight genes are both associated with a downstream unique sequence uh, at their end, which is not present at the other DUF999 genes. And they were able to show by PCR that in the, in the survivors, they can, sh they can obtain this PCR product. So based on that then, we believe that it's the arrangement of these Pombe specific genes in this relatively large genome or larger chromosomes uh, compared to Cerevisiae that are allowing this highly efficient uh, healing of double strand breaks in the subtelomeric region, which is distinct from what's happening in the interior of the chromosome. Okay, so now I want to move on to something that uh, Yan Wee Li found while we were constructing a sequence barcoded transposon insertion for Pom library for Pombe. And what I'm going to be talking about is a famous and highly studied complex called MRN or the MRE 11 Rad 50 uh, NBS1 complex in Pombe and mammals and XRS2 in, in Cerevisiae. Uh, so again, this is what, how we're thinking about damage and arrest. Uh, but one way to get around this arrest, of course, is to repair the break, for which you've, uh, Jim has told you a lot about. And so you have homologous recombination assays where you repair by copying off another, the uh, homologous or sister chromatid, and those are generally considered error-free, or error-prone uh, assays where you, or mechanisms where you take these two ends and ligate them together, usually with small amounts of deletion or mutation or uh, varying amounts. And then as long as you don't hurt an essential gene, you can continue to grow. So a lot, the exper what I've just told you and what you've heard from Jim with these XO, um, H, that is GAL HO systems, is that you're essentially making a restriction enzyme cut. And you make a ligatable end, which can be ligated in a process called non-homologous end joining, which generally involves zero to five base pairs of uh, sequence loss. Or you can resect the five prime strand and get three prime extensions, which are great substrates for homologous recombination, or some other kinds of end joining, which we're calling micro which are termed microhomology mediated end joining, or even single strand annealing, which involve larger amounts of uh, deletions. So that's a great experiment for the lab, and people have done a lot of things with it, but in, out in the real world where, we're, where they're treating patients, usually they're hitting them with radiation or chemotherapy. And the end result of that double strand break is a chemically modified end which is not ligatable. So we have to have a, pro a step in lesion removal or processing, which then produces the double strand break, which can be repaired by these kinds of assays, or, or I'm sorry, of processes. So <clears throat> this is also an important study to un or process to understand, but using radiation chemotherapy is, is difficult because these lesions are random throughout the genome. And so finding the, the sequence before or after mutation can be challenging. Uh, and it's hard to do repeated tests at a single site to know what the fate of this break is going to be, depending on where it is. So <clears throat> what we have and others have turned to is that using transposon excision to make these non-ligatable ends. Uh, so there's a family of transposon called the hat transposons, called the hat transposon, whose excision uh, once you express transposase, leaves these hairpin capped ends. And these hairpins are actually rather common things that cellular uh, cells know how to deal with because they can occur in trinucleotide repeats, inverted, um, uh, inverted repeats within the genome. And Jim showed you an unusual jumping mechanism, which uh, I, I may favor more than him because we like to think about palindromes more. Uh, so these can be repaired by cellular enzymes, and the advantage then of this is that we have a defined lesion. We know its sequences before. We can study the sequences afterwards, and then we can do multiple tests at this region. So the next question then that we're going to address is what form of end joining is going to allow this excision uh, of the transposon? And experiments, as I'll show you, done in, that Jim did in collaboration with Clifford Wheel and, our, and now in our lab have different outcomes. Uh, so first, I want to 
give you the, the quick back of the envelope non-homologous enjoining review where uh, experiments with restriction enzyme cuts either in vitro or in vivo and S. cerevisiae require these components. Uh, the Ku heterodimer which binds to pro DNA ends, DNA ligase 4 which ligates the ends together and then the MRX complex which is the cerevisiae version of MRN. In contrast, in Pombi and mice, in these restriction enzyme experiments, MRN or MRX plays little or no role in, the, in this frequency. Uh, so what's the deal with MRN, MRX? Uh, it's a triprotein tri complex. It has MRE11. It's known to have nuclease activity. There's a number of genetic experiments in cerevisiae suggesting it has a role in hairpin cutting. So that was interesting to us. It uh, also has a dimerization motif which is thought to tether two of the ends together to help uh, heal them. And finally it can recruit another nuclease which has a different name, homologs have different names in the different organisms, but in POMB that's CTP1. So <clears throat> we wanted to know what kind of repair occurs here uh, when you have a non-ligatable end uh, for non-homologous and for transposon excision, and it's been done in cerevisiae, but it's not exactly non-homologous end joining. Instead, it uses a hybrid pathway, which is termed my, uh, was termed by Clifford Wheel and, and Jim Haber as microhomology mediated non-homologous end joining. Uh, and that alphabet soup comes from the fact that uh, when they looked at the repair sites from these two, uh, joining these hairpins back together, they saw a series of deletion mutations that look a lot like microhomology mediated end joining, but this process requires Ku, which is a, the end binding factor, which is usually only associated with non homologous end joining and is dispensable for the MMEJ process. So, as, as we were um, doing a characterization of the transposon, the hat transposon in our library construction, we wanted to look at excision and ask whether. POMB required MRN for this form of non-homologous end joining or any end joining reaction and whether it was using a hybrid pathway. And so in our experiments, we're doing a PCR-based assay to look at the frequency of transposon excision. Uh, it's important to realize that after you excise, homologous recombination would, re if you only excise for one chromosome and you have another chromosome, the other chromosome in the cell has the transposon, you're just going to copy that information, you won't get excision. But if you do end joining, you'll put, bring these two ends together without the transposon. And now, this is smaller by the size of the transposon, and so you can use different PCR reactions to amplify the excision event that won't amplify the homologous recombination event. And so when we look at the frequent, we construct standard curves and we look at the frequencies of excision and we can easily tell tenfold differences in frequencies uh, between these. So what I'm showing you here then are frequencies of ten different cultures where we take the most, the median uh, frequency as what the excision frequency is in the cell. So this is the wild type. These are the two canonical non-homologous end joining proteins and we have little or no detectable non-homologous end joining in that assay. And now we see that the MRN complex is required uh, because we lose the non-homologous end joining in that, in that process as well. So we then go back and we've sequenced a large number of these, uh, or a number of these, and we get repair events that occur, are occurring by non-homologous end joining by its original definition of zero to five base pairs of deletion or mutations. All the mutations are at the fusion site where these two uh, hairpin ends come back together. So <clears throat> the next question that we wanted to address in this series of studies was whether MRE11 is the hairpin nuclease as suggested by genetic experiments in cerevisiae. And to do that we used, made use of some mutations from Paul Russell's lab, one of which is uh, in the dimerization domain of MRE11. And another one is a mutation that, block, that eliminates uh, or should affect greatly reduce the exo and endonuclease functions of MRE11. And so to summarize these data then, uh, you can see that we, this is our wild type level of activity and then this is the dimerization mutant which reduces it by about 300 fold. So MRE11, the MRE11 dimerization domain mutant is clearly uh, 
affecting non-homologous end joining. And, but when we look at the nuclease minus mutant, we're getting a lot, we're only getting a threefold difference compared to the wild type. And as I said, this is a, an assay where we can tell tenfold differences. So we're not confident that a threefold difference is actually meaningful. So essentially, the, the nuclease mutant may be having no effect on non homologous end joining of these non ligatable ends. But as I told you, then, not, MRN can, can recruit this other nuclease, CTP1. And so the concern was that CTP1 was going to be brought and then compensate for MRN, and that's why we're getting this high level. So we did the yeast experiment of making the double mutant, and we get clearly no inhibition of non-homologous end joining. Again, it's threefold higher in this case from, from the wild type, so we're not sure that this is different from wild type at all. Uh, but what we do conclude from these experiments then is that this con the MRN CTP1 complex is unlikely to be this hairpin cleaving activity in Schizosaccharomyces pombi. So then for this story, we've got two evolutionally divergent yeast, and they appear to have diverged in their repair of these non-ligatable ends. So in, S in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where you have this hybrid repair method, which shows more nucleolytic degradation than we're seeing in S. pompey. And this might be one of the reasons that we love, actually love yeast, budding yeast so much, because it's high levels of homologous recombination and was one of the things that really got it, what, was what made the system so attractive early on. And recent, a number of experiments from other labs have shown that this high nuclease activity is one of the things that's helping drive homologous recombination. In contrast, we have a lot more non-homologous end joining in Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which might be associated with, its, with less degradation. Uh, the, as I finish, I just want to tell you about what we're thinking about going on at non-ligatable ends. Uh, it's known in vitro, at least, that co the Ku heterodimer can bind to DNA hairpins. Uh, so we're suggesting that that initially binds to the, to the hairpins left by transposon excision. And then like it has been proposed in homologous recombination, the MRN complex comes in and helps displace Ku and may or may not um, recruit CTP1. But this complex is actually what's important for recruiting the actual nuclease that is going to hair open the hairpin. And we don't know what that is yet. Once the hairpin is open, different kinds of microhomology base pairing can allow non-homologous end joining. Oh. We'll end with, say, uh, looking at, thinking about both stories I've told you, the breaking, uh, the break healing at, at the sub-telomere that's so efficient, and this limited resection of these non-ligatable ends suggests that these are things that actually thwart some of the therapies that work by damaging DNA. Uh, and so that just makes us think about what, what, what are the ways that we could increase these DNA damaging agents, uh, at least in Pombi and pro possibly in humans. And one of those would be, of course, to increase the amount of resection you get when you process a non-ligatable end. And we would also like ways to prevent this from then going into other kinds of homology searching mechanisms uh, so you can prevent repair and then use that therapy to there fragment the genome more in cancer cells. Uh, so again, these are the graduate students who did the work and our funding agencies, and I'll finish with that. Let questions and then the break. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So certainly for the capture of the left end. So, so we have left and right end chromosome 2, and we're breaking on the right end. And that, that would have to come over and do break-induced replication. Right. Uh, but for the capture of the gene that's out here, that could be single-strand annealing or another mechanism. Certainly, if, if you were talking, in your talk, you were talking about the Rabelcon uh, conformation where the centromeres are all clustered together. Uh, it's, I don't... In interphase cycling, mitotic pombi, I'm not sure where the telomeres are. If the telomeres are, if instead of like this, the telomeres are like this, then you can certainly do everything could be break induced recombination because they're close together. Well, I mean, there are some 
Right, right. No, that would be that would be interesting to to try. Hey, how do you move to the three questions? Okay. All right.